Assalamualaikum and hello everyone. Welcome back to this channel for part 2 of Disney. Previously, we have divided the cause of Disney into those which are sudden in onset, rapid and gradual. And we have covered some of the diseases from the first two group. So in this one, we are going to look into the third one, specifically lung abscess, pulmonary effusion, bronchiectasis, tuberculosis, lung cancer and some of the causes from interstitial lung disease. And as in the previous one, we are going to look into the basic pathology of each disease first, then each of their clinical features. Before we start, these are my references, roughly the same as the first one. Let us begin. Lung abscess is a localized separation within the lung characterized by necrosis and cavitation. We can remember the causes as the following. Organisms that commonly cause abscess following pneumonia are Streptococcus, Staphylococcus, Klebsiella, and tuberculosis. If it is due to aspiration, we need to think of oral flora anaerobes. They are exclusively isolated in 60% of cases. We also need to think of non-infective causes such as lung cancer or penetrating traumatic injury and possibility of septic embolism commonly from tricuspid bacterial endocarditis or infected thrombophlebitis. There are some differences in terms of common location for the stated cause of abscess. Aspiration, for example, which is the most common cause. The abscess is usually singular at the right lung because the right bronchus is a more direct continuation of the trachea and at the upper lung zones, either apical or posterior segment of the upper lobes or superior segment of the lower lobes. For post pneumonic abscess, it is usually multiple with basal predilection. Multiple abscess is seen in septic embolism as well, affecting any regions of the lung. But all of these, of course, are not absolute. Harrison's classify abscess into primary and secondary based on its etiology. Primary is due to aspiration, whereas secondary is due to other underlying lung disease. Next is pleural effusion. Pleural effusion simply means excess collection of fluid in the pleural space. It can be due to increased fluid formation or decreased fluid clearance. Fluid can come into the pleural space from parietal pleura, visceral or peritoneal cavity. It escapes the capillary due to hemodynamic disturbance such as increase in hydrostatic pressure in congestive heart failure or chronic kidney disease or decreased vascular oncotic pressure such as in chronic liver disease or nephrotic syndrome due to hypoalbuminemia. Any form of inflammation can cause increase in capillary permeability such as infection, malignancy, autoimmune disease or pulmonary infarction. Fluid from peritoneal cavity can cross into the pleural space via diaphragmatic openings in case of massive ascites such as seen in chronic liver disease or Mitch syndrome. The pleural fluid is usually emptied into the lymphatic vessel, so if it is obstructed or injured, this can cause fluid accumulation as well. Common examples are iatrogenic trauma from thoracic surgery or compression from any mediastinal mass. The fluid collected is either transudates or exudates. Causes of transudates are due to the first two groups above, while the rest cause exudates except in massive ascites because that would depend on the cause of ascites. If the fluid is serous, it is also known as hydrothorax. Usually, it is caused by transudates. Other types of effusion such as paranormonic effusion, empyema thoracis, tuberculous effusion, Malignant effusion, hemothorax or chylothorax, all of these are exudates. Chylothorax is especially seen in cases due to lymphatic obstruction or lymphatic injury. Alright, next we have bronchiectasis. It is the permanent dilation of bronchi and bronchioles due to the destruction of the structural components that hold them, which are the smooth muscle and the elastic tissue. The underlying causes generally are due to chronic bronchial obstruction by mass or mucus plug, or chronic inflammation or infection or both. Bronchiectasis can be focal or diffuse. Focal is usually due to obstruction, for example by solid tumor, foreign body or massive lymphadenopathy. Diffuse causes are many, such as the following. Examples of disease with dyskinetic or immotile cilia are cystic fibrosis and cartagena syndrome. The pooling of mucus plug 
leads to diffuse bronchial obstruction. Recurrent pneumonia or single severe pneumonia can also cause bronchiectasis. The example for radiation for chest tumor are breast cancer. Fungal allergy is specifically referring to allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. Inflammatory bowel disease is also associated. It is relatively seen more in ulcerative colitis than Crohn's disease. Connective tissue disease cause chronic inflammation. We will talk about idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis in a second. Tuberculosis is a chronic infection. And immunodeficiency such as HIV or gamma globulinemia are also predisposing factors to chronic infection. Radiation and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis in particular cause bronchiectasis by traction. That means the bronchi and bronchioles are dilated due to the pull by the fibrotic interstitial space rather than a direct injury to the bronchial wall itself. So this is a rather a special kind of bronchiectasis. In roughly 25-50% to 50% of cases, however, the cause of this disease is not determined although evaluated. There are three types of bronchiectasis seen based on radiographic findings. Tubular or syndrical, varicose and cystic. These three are actually stages depicting level of severity of bronchiectasis rather than a separate types of pathological disease process. As you can see here, the level of distortion increases going down the list. This does not differentiate the cause of bronchiectasis, but rather it helps us to diagnose. So any of these three changes, if seen, are bronchiectatic changes. The ones that may help us to identify the cause is the location of bronchiectasis. For example, diffuse bronchiectasis of bilateral upper lung zones are suggestive of cystic fibrosis and post-radiation fibrosis. Lower lung zone is seen in connective tissue disease, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and hypogamma globulinemia. Middle zone bronchiectasis in non-tuberculous mycobacterial infection and cartagenous syndrome. And central is suggestive of fungal allergy and other syndromic diseases. Alright, now the fourth one is tuberculosis. According to Robin's pathology, tuberculosis is any infection by mycobacterium tuberculosis complex. For example, mycobacterium tuberculosis, mycobacterium bovis, microti or africanum. It is useful to remember some of the important features that shape our understanding about this bacteria. It is slow growing, takes about 6 to 8 weeks to culture in solid media such as Lowenstein Jensen and roughly 2 to 3 weeks with liquid media. So other investigations may prove more useful to help us detect and treat this disease much earlier. It is also an obligate aerobes, so it tends to prefer the lung epices because there is more ventilation. It is neutral on gram stains because the cell wall has high lipid content, which is a hydrophobic feature, so it is also impermeable to some antibiotics as well. It is acid fast, meaning it resists decolorization by phenol, and lastly, it is rod shaped, so bacilli rather than cocci. TB is mainly transmitted via air droplets such as coughing and sneezing. Some amount of causes are due to ingestion of unpasteurized milk contaminated with Mycobacterium bovis in particular. A risk of transmission is close contact with a TB patient, especially those with sputum smear positive and pulmonary TB with cavitation. They are relatively more infectious than those with smear negative or without pulmonary cavitation. Generally, we can divide tuberculosis into pulmonary, extrapulmonary, or both. For pulmonary TB, we have primary and post-primary or secondary tuberculosis. But let's try to understand the disease process first. Majority of patients contacted TB via air droplets, so generally TB initially infects the lung. Depending on bacterial load and the host immunologic defense level, if there is low bacterial load and high host immunologic defense, patient will have latent pulmonary TB infection. Simply put, they will have an infection without an active disease. But if it is the opposite, for example, low immunologic defense is seen in children and HIV patients because the immune cells required to fight off this infection, which are the T lymphocytes or cell-mediated immunity are low in both groups. It is not matured enough in children and is low in HIV due to the destruction by the virus. 
In this case, patient will have an infection with an active pulmonary disease, specifically called primary tuberculosis. Both of them can undergo spontaneous remission with or without occult hematogenous dissemination. But if the defense is too low, primary tuberculosis can progress locally. This is called primary progressive TB. These two can achieve remission later but most probably with a clinical intervention rather than spontaneous. Or in the worst case, it progresses to miliary TB which is the manifestation of tuberculosis infection in both pulmonary and extrapulmonary at the same time. After phagocytized by macrophage, they are able to prevent phagosome and lysosomal fusion, hence they can escape killing by our immune system. So they can remain dormant in our body although clinically the symptoms has passed remission. If let's say our immune defense is low, for example due to aging or immunosuppressive drugs after some time, the disease can reactivate again. If there is no occult dissemination in the first place, the reactivation may reoccur in the lung, which is the primary site of infection. In this case, we call them post-primary TB or secondary TB. In the past, it is also called adult TB to differentiate with primary TB which is usually seen in children. If there was occult dissemination from previous infection, the disease may reactivate again elsewhere and we call this extrapulmonary TB. Both postprimary and extrapulmonary TB usually do not present together. The features of extrapulmonary TB here are also somewhat different to those in military TB. We will look into that. So how to differentiate all these clinically? Well, this may be different according to the case definitions provided by your local healthcare guideline for contact tracing and etc. The source I'm using is the Malaysian guideline for tuberculosis third edition. Now we know that in pulmonary latent TB, there is evidence of TB infection without presence of active disease. So clinically, these patients are usually asymptomatic. But tuberculin tests in these cases will be positive, indicating that the host already developed cell-mediated immune response to this mycobacteria, so it suggests that he or she has encountered this infection previously. Smear and culture from throat swab is negative, and x-ray changes may be normal or static. Static meaning, let's say if there is a calcification seen on the x-ray, it remains as such for over 6 months of monitoring, so simply no evidence of active disease. For pulmonary TB, we have both evidence of infection and active disease. That means clinically patient is symptomatic. In terms of investigation, the diagnosis of pulmonary TB requires either two smear positive acid fast bacilli or one smear positive AFB with suggestive radiographic findings or one smear positive AFB with one culture positive sputum. Or simply, culture positive sputum with negative smear acid fast bacilli. For case reporting, according to the Malaysian guideline, we have either patient with smear positive pulmonary TB or smear negative pulmonary TB. This is important because as we have learned earlier, patient with smear positive pulmonary TB is highly infectious, relatively more than those with smear negative. So more vigorous contact tracing, isolations and vigilance are required. The form of active disease in primary TB is quite different to those in post-primary, although the symptoms may be similar. Primary TB is suggested by presence of gone focus in the lung, a granulomatous reaction usually in low or middle periphery lung fill with or without pleural reaction. The bacteria can spread via lymphatic vessels and cause regional lymphadenopathy. In this case, it is called gone complex. This is important especially for radiographic evidence of primary tuberculosis. After remission, it is seen as nodular calcification in X-ray. For most of patients, this disease is self-limiting, but taking into account the host immune and bacterial load as well, the primary disease can become worse. Primary progressive TB is when not only that they have active disease, but locally the disease is aggressive, worsening or uncontained. Some of the characteristics, for example, is when the primary site rapidly enlarges and leads to necrosis and cavitation, pleurisy with tuberculous pleural effusion, or complicated lymphadenopathy when the lymph nodes are too large that it compresses the airway, causing atelectasis 
or it can also rupture into the airway and cause pneumonia. To the very end of the spectrum, when the host's immune system is at the lowest, they can have miliary TB where both pulmonary and extrapulmonary are involved at the same time. You can think of this like a widely metastasized cancer, but in this case, it is the dissemination of mycobacteria infection in the body. The lesions seen in the lung are multiple granulomas formation bilaterally and diffuse. For extrapulmonary, granulomas can occur in liver and spleen as well, causing hepatosplenomegaly. Other features are extrathoracic lymphadenopathy, choroidal tubercles, meningitis, and disseminated intravascular coagulation. Among those with TB reactivation, 55% of them develop post-primary TB. To diagnose this, the requirements are roughly similar to primary TB, but pathologically it is different, hence the radiographic evidence required for the diagnosis is different too. The form of active disease here varies as well from small to extensive parenchymal involvement depending on the two factors that we have mentioned earlier. It is usually seen as cavitation at the upper lung zones because these organisms are obligate aerobes. It can simply limit it to this, or the cavitation can erode into the bronchi and cause bronchogenic spread to other airway as well. And when the other foci cause cavitation elsewhere, eventually they all can coalesce and cause caseating pneumonia. In roughly 45% of patients, they develop extrapulmonary TB instead without pulmonary involvement. So these patients generally are non-infectious. The manifestation varies according to the site. In order of frequency, lymph nodes is the most common, followed by pleura, genitourinary tract, bones, joints, meninges, gastrointestinal system, and pericardium. Alright, now let us look at lung cancer. Cancer is a general term, but usually when we talk about lung cancer, we are referring to the lung carcinoma, which are tumors that arise from the respiratory epithelium. Because carcinoma constitutes about 90% of lung tumors, while the other 10% are due to carcinoids, mesenchymal tumors, and others. There are so far three updates on lung tumors classification from WHO in 2004-2011, and the most recent is in 2015. Though there are some modifications to the old ones, the 2004 classification still remains relevant and widely used and referred to. Lung carcinoma is generally classified into small cells and non-small cell carcinoma because the natural progression of the disease and the therapeutic approaches for both groups are different. For example, the 5-year survival rate in small cell carcinoma is less than 5%, whereas for non-small cell, roughly around 13-19%. to This, of course, is an average number. The survival rate would actually depend on the stage of cancer when patient is initially diagnosed. For non-small cell carcinoma, the three most common are squamous adenocarcinoma and large cell carcinoma. 15% of lung carcinoma is due to small cell, roughly about 20% due to squamous, 40% due to adenocarcinoma, 5% due to large cell carcinoma whereas the extra 20% constitutes the other rare types not included here. All of these are histological classifications, but there are some extra features that are commonly associated with each group. For example, the small cell carcinoma is known to be naturally aggressive in terms of local growth. It arises from peribronchial, so it is usually central, associated with early metastasis, generally with more features of paraneoplastic syndrome than non-small cell carcinoma. In particular, they secrete ectopic adrenocorticotrophin hormone which can cause hypokalemia, syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion which cause hyponatremia, and myoneuropathic syndrome such as myasthenic Ethan Lambert syndrome and cerebellar degeneration. And this cancer is also associated with heavy smoker, that is cigarette smoking more than 10 pack years. Squamous cell carcinoma is also central, whereas adenocarcinoma and large cell are usually peripheral. It also metastasized relatively much later compared to the other two. Like small cell carcinoma, it is associated with heavy smoker as well. Adenocarcinoma is seen more in those who are light or non-smokers. 
A paraneoplastic syndrome that is usually associated with squamous cell or ectopic PTH secretion, which cause hypercalcemia, whereas hypertrophic osteoarthropathy such as digital clubbing is seen more in adenocarcinoma. When seen under microscope, as the name implies, it is smaller in size which probably due to scanty cytoplasm and absent nucleoli, it is characteristically described as having salt and pepper pattern. The features defining squamous cells are keratinization and cellular bridging. However, this is identical to squamous cells cancer elsewhere, so it cannot differentiate primary and secondary carcinoma. Features of adenocarcinoma are glandular-like features such as acina, lepidic pattern, papillary or solid. All of these are subtypes of adenocarcinoma. Large cell carcinoma, on the other hand, are diagnosis of exclusion. It lacks the cytological features or patterns such as seen in the other cells. In comparison to a small cell, it has large and prominent nucleoli with moderate cytoplasm, which explains the larger cell size. Some immunological markers are also helpful to differentiate them such as the use of thyroid transcription factor 1. It is positive in small cell. Another immunohistological marker, which is NAPA, is negative in small cell carcinoma. Both are negative in squamous, whereas both are positives in adenocarcinoma. In 2011 WHO classification, it further revised the subtypes of adenocarcinoma. In 2015, there is an introduction of new histological types. Neuroendocrine tumors is also introduced as a new subgroup. We can divide the presentation of this disease according to its primary lesion regional spread, extraterrestrial spread, and paraneoplastic syndrome. Primary lesion in the center and periphery may present differently. Regionally, if spread in the center, it can cause problem in the nearby structures such as tracheal obstruction, esophageal compression, superior vena cava obstruction, or pericardial extension. If the cancer spread peripherally over the lung epices, the nearby structure that can be affected, for example, are phrenic nerve, vagus and its recurrent laryngeal nerve, the sympathetic trunk which causes Horner syndrome, brachial plexus for Panko syndrome, subclavian artery, and the brachiocephalic or subclavian vein. Lung carcinoma spreading over the nearby structure in the lung epices is also known as the Panko's tumor. Others not included here are lymphatic obstruction, massive lymphadenopathy, and pleural effusion. It can metastasize elsewhere, commonly to the brain, bone, epidural, liver, or adrenal gland. For paraneoplastic syndrome, there are many. You can make a textbook out of this syndrome alone. Constitutional symptoms are part of paraneoplastic syndrome. Others include endocrine syndrome, skeletal or connective tissue syndrome, neurologic myopathic syndrome, hematologic, cutaneous, and lastly, renal. Some of the paraneoplastic syndrome that I have mentioned earlier are also included in this list. Alright, last one before we look into each clinical features, let's look at interstitial lung disease. Previously, we have discussed specific disease or diagnosis. Interstitial disease, however, is just a group of heterogeneous disorders involving the lung parenchyma and that is the structure encompassing the alveolar epithelium, interstitium, and the vascular endothelium. So it is very general. But we can classify the disorders in this group based on the types of histopathological patterns seen either predominantly inflammation and fibrosis or predominantly granulomatous reaction. So we can also call them fibrosing lung disease and granulomatous lung disease. There are a few more types such as pulmonary hemorrhagic syndrome, eosinophilic syndrome and others according to Robin's pathology. Fibrosing lung disease occurs when there is chronic inflammation of the alveolar wall that extends to the interstitium. Over time, this can lead to scarring or interstitial fibrosis. In a more severe condition, the fibrosis can extend up to the airways and pulmonary vasculature. We can further divide the causes of fibrosing interstitial lung disease into idiopathic groups, connective tissue disease, occupational lung disease, and fibrosis associated with treatment. The most common cause of idiopathic interstitial lung disease are idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Others include cryptogenic organizing pneumonia and acute interstitial pneumonia. Examples of connective tissue disease are the following. 
Occupational lung disease associated with pulmonary fibrosis is due to prolonged exposure to mineral dust. This is generally called pneumoconiosis. Disease due to prolonged exposure to coal, for example, is called arthracosis or coal workers' pneumoconiosis. Silicosis due to silica exposure, asbestosis due to asbestos, and so on. The work-related, for example, are mining, welding, and industrial manufacturing. Radiation and certain drugs are also implicated as the cause of lung fibrosis. For granulomatous lung disease, as the name implies, there are formation of granulomas, but they are also usually accompanied by fibrosis as well. We can divide the causes into idiopathic, small vessel vasculitis, and occupational lung disease. Examples are sarcoidosis, Wagner's granulomatosis, and hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Hypersensitivity pneumonitis is associated with prolonged exposure to organic dust, for example, exposure to hay which causes farmer's lung disease and bird's excreta which causes pigeon's breeder's lung. Another helpful classification that can help us to narrow down the differential diagnosis are based on the anatomical lobe predilection. Ankylosing spondylitis, cystic fibrosis, tuberculosis, occupational lung disease except asbestosis, Radiation pneumonitis and sarcoidosis usually cause fibrosis at the upper lobe, whereas asbestosis, connective tissue disease except ankylosing spondylitis, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and drugs usually cause lower lobe fibrosis. Common drugs, for example, are amiodarone, which is an antiarrhythmic, nitrofurantoin, a common antibiotic for urinary tract infection, bleomycin, which is a chemotherapeutic drug, Penicillamine, a chelator for copper and cysteine, and procanamide, which is also an antiarrhythmic drug. In this video, we are going to briefly learn about idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and sarcoidosis, which are among the commonest. Connective tissue disease, which is also common, will be covered in other videos related to other more common symptoms, such as joint pain. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is a disease of unknown cause. Genetic predisposition is implicated. In 50% of cases, this disease is familial. Usually, it occurs in elderly more than 60 years old, except in familiar cases where patient can present as early as 40 years old. Clinical features associated are fine late inspiratory crackles with digital clubbing. In the late stage, when the fibrosis involves pulmonary vasculature, it can cause pulmonary hypertension and core pulmonary. Reticular opacity is seen on X-ray, predominantly at the lower lung field. Features seen in high-resolution CT scan, for example, are subpleural density, traction bronchiectasis, and honeycombing appearance. Treatment is either by immunosuppressive drugs to delay disease progression. However, lung transplantation is the only definitive treatment available. The median survival rate after diagnosis is roughly about 3 years. Sarcoidosis is a non-caseating systemic granulomatous disease due to unknown cause. Possible infectious organisms are implicated such as Mycobacterium and Propyobacter acne. However, tuberculosis usually causes caseating granuloma unlike sarcoidosis. The systemic presentation also closely resembles TB with some exceptions. Lung is the common site involved followed by skin eye, liver, spleen, and others such as the nerve and the heart. We will look into the specific clinical features after this. Alright, now before we begin to compare each clinical features, just a quick reminder, I have discussed and clarified some of the terms used in respiratory examination such as what is meant by respiratory distress, vascular or bronchial breathing, crackles, crepitation, ronchi, and the like. Because the use of terms may vary in different sources, so make sure you check that one out first so that we are on the same page. Let us start first with pleural effusion. Pleural effusion causes dyspnea like other diseases in this video, but physical examination alone may be sufficient to guide us to the diagnosis. Generally, patient will be in respiratory distress. If the effusion is massive, it can cause trachea to be deviated to the contralateral side. Expansion on the affected side is reduced. Percussion is the most helpful sign for this disease. Presence of stony dullness strongly suggests effusion. This is supported by absence of breath sound over the area of effusion, with or without bronchial breathing above the effusion due to the compressive atelectasis, as we have discussed in part 1 of this video. 
Added sound can be none or plural rub just above the area of effusion. If you get this patient for undergraduate exam, sometimes the patient may already be on chest tube drainage. So we can check the tube for its content and its connection at the end. If there is nothing inside the tube, probably a case of pneumothorax. If there is serious fluid collection, it may suggest hydrothorax due to transudative causes, but we cannot rule out exudative causes without looking at the pleural fluid analysis for Light's criteria. Gross perulean fluid collection suggests empyematoresis, blood for hemothorax, and milky white fluid suggests chylothorax. Location of effusion is also helpful to differentiate the cause of effusion. Unilateral right-sided effusion with massive ascites suggests effusion that comes via the diaphragmatic openings. Common causes are hepatic hydrothorax in chronic liver disease and Meech syndrome in benign ovarian tumor. Bilateral effusion usually suggests transudative causes. Alright, let's look at lung abscess. Symptoms of lung abscess closely resemble pneumonia. In fact, it is a type of pneumonia. But there are a few differences here and there. Lung abscess tends to be more gradual in onset or subacute. Fever, like in any abscess, has an on and off pattern, either intermittent or remittent. It is usually associated with chills and rigor and night sweats. If the abscess form erodes and irritates the nearby airway structure, patient may have productive cough with false smelling and purulent sputum, or hemoptysis. Like pneumonia, it can also cause pleurisy, hence pleuritic chest pain. These five symptoms, they are very non-specific to abscess. On and off fever, of course, would suggest infection, but that includes other types of infection such as tuberculosis. In fact, we will hear about these five symptoms repetitively for most of the diseases discussed in this video. For clinical signs, generally there are non-specific findings as well, such as ill or septic looking. Digital clubbing is also seen, although the pathophysiology of this sign is still poorly understood. But it helps in a way that it suggests presence of chronic or insidious disease that may contribute to this patient dyspnea rather than an acute one. For respiratory examination, a sign that is perhaps more specific to abscess or cavitation is the presence of cavernous or amphoric bronchial breathing, in contrast to tubular sound. To differentiate these two, however, may prove difficult. So for this disease to be on the top of your list of differentials from clinical evaluation alone, I think the risk factors plays a big role. Aspiration is the leading cause of abscess, so three things that we should consider are does this patient has impact, gag or swallowing reflex such as dose in stroke? Secondly, is there any recent event that can cause cognitive impairments such as episodes of seizure or recent surgery requiring general anesthesia where aspiration may likely occur? And lastly, you can also look briefly for poor oral hygiene care. And if the patient is an intravenous drug user, we may want to auscultate over the chest to look for murmur suggesting tricuspid endocarditis. Presence of cachexia and constitutional symptoms may suggest underlying malignancy. Next is bronchiectasis. So bronchiectasis can have similar symptoms as well, but mainly the symptoms seen are dyspnea, excessive sputum production, and hemoptysis. The dyspnea progressively worsens like those in COPD. Sputum in this case is especially excessive, copious with false smelling and purulent consistency. It is usually in the early morning because it collects overnight. Hemoptysis can be non, minimal or massive. With worsening dyspnea, patient can have reduced effort tolerance. As we have learned earlier, bronchiectasis happens due to chronic obstruction or inflammation. So patient can have constitutional symptoms as well due to the chronic insult. Due to the destruction of bronchial tree, the accumulation of sputum provides a safe haven for microorganism to proliferate. Hence, episodic exacerbation of dyspnea like those in COPD can also occur in bronchiectasis due to superimposing acute infection, either mild or severe. So patient may also present with an acute fever with a background of similar recurrent episodes in the past. For signs, generally look for respiratory distress as well. Digital clubbing is also suggestive and halitosis or bad breath because of the sputum-filled clogged airway. From respiratory examination, 
the feature suggestive of bronchiectasis is coarse crackles. The extensiveness of areas involved either localized or diffuse, and its specific location either upper, mid, or lower zones may suggest its causes as stated above. So quite similar symptoms to lung abscess, but the manner in which the symptoms present are different. Other differentiating factors include risk factors such as history of pulmonary tuberculosis, concurrent underlying disease such as cystic fibrosis, connective tissue disease, or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Alright, let's move on to tuberculosis. Clinically, we already know that those with pulmonary latent TB is asymptomatic. For primary and post-primary tuberculosis, the symptoms are indistinguishable. It includes fever, cough, hemoptysis, constitutional symptoms, dyspnea, and chest pain. The fever is similar to lung abscess, characteristically with on and off pattern and night sweats. Cough is initially dry but can become purulent later or tinged with blood. Massive hemoptysis can also occur. Constitutional symptoms such as weight loss, anorexia, and malaise are also seen. Dyspnea and pleuritic chest pain resembling pneumonia occur when more extensive part of the lung is involved, probably not with simple gone focus. For physical signs, patients can have digital clubbing, muscle wasting and conjunctival pallor due to anemia, but all of these are non-specific. Respiratory examination most of the time shows no abnormalities. Localized amphoric or cavernous bronchial breathing may suggest cavitation, which is a feature of post-primary TB. Hyalur lymphadenopathy may compress edges and airway and cause narrowing, so localized wheezing or ronchi can also be heard. If the lesions coalesce and form caseating pneumonia, signs such as crackles may be present. For extra pulmonary TB, the symptoms are according to the site involved and they usually don't occur concurrently with pulmonary TB. But for miliary TB, both features are usually seen together. Corodal to buckles is fatonomonic for miliary TB. It is seen in about 30% of cases. This sign is considered diagnostic for miliary TB according to some source. Other features include hepatospilinomegaly, meningismus, and generalized lymphadenopathy. Since tuberculosis easily spread via air droplets, history of contact with any person with similar symptoms or known case of tuberculosis is very important. It raises the suspicion of TB infection. Travel history to endemic countries also should be noted. Next is lung cancer. If the primary lesion is at the center, patient may present with cough due to the irritation of the airway, hemoptysis if it erodes the vascular structure, dyspnea if it compresses the airway. Peripheral lesion may cause dyspnea as well, perhaps with lesser intensity, and pleuritic chest pain if it extends to the pleura. On respiratory examination, if it compresses the airway, it can cause localized wheezing or ronchi. Any retained lung secretions due to inflammatory exudates can cause crackles. If there is pleurisy, we may hear pleural rub as well. So we can say that respiratory examination findings are non-specific as well because other lung disease can present with this. Risk factors such as elderly and cigarette smoking should prompt us to include lung cancer as differentials. But keep in mind, adenocarcinoma is commonly seen in non-smokers and women. We can also highly suspect lung malignancy if there are symptoms or signs that suggest regional spread. Tracheal obstruction causes dyspnea as well, so that is not really distinguishing. But esophageal compression, for example, can add dysphagia to the symptoms. If there is superior vena cava obstruction, the chest and neck veins will be dilated. JVP will be raised and patient may have facial plethora. Tumor extending to the pericardium can cause pericarditic chest pain and pericardial rub. Invasion to nerves such as phrenic can cause abdominal breathing paradox, hoarseness if recurrent laryngeal nerve, Horner's syndrome if it invades the sympathetic trunk, and Penko syndrome if brachial plexus. Compression to the subclavian artery can cause radio radial delay. Compression to brachiocephalic veins will show features similar to superior vena cava obstruction. But if much more distal at subclavian vein, perhaps only unilateral upper limb edema. Pleural effusion in lung carcinoma can be due to metastasis to pleura causing malignant effusion. Ruptured vessels can cause hemothorax and lymphatic vessels erosion can cause chylothorax. 
Some patients may present with non-respiratory symptoms and signs due to metastasis such as the following. Other signs that you can quickly look for are paraneoplastic syndrome such as cachexia, digital clubbing, and cutaneous sign. The last one is interstitial lung disease. There are a lot of disease here and the clinical features varies according to each disease, but the common features of both diseases are lung fibrosis although relatively less predominant in granulomatous disease. In terms of dyspnea, generally most of the diseases here will cause chronic gradually worsening dyspnea. The ones that can cause acute dyspnea are idiopathic acute interstitial pneumonia and hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So you can add this disease to your acute differentials. Subacute dyspnea is seen in cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, while the rest are chronic. Episodic presentation is also seen in vasculitis and cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. For clinical signs, pulmonary fibrosis are suggested by digital clubbing and fine crackles, but we should also look for complications such as features of core pulmonale which I have covered in previous video. Crackles are late inspiratory, but as the fibrosis progresses up to the major airway, pen inspiratory fine crackles are heard. We have looked through the features of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis just now. For sarcoidosis, about one third of patients are asymptomatic. In contrast to tuberculosis, most of patients are asymptomatic, about 90% of cases rather than symptomatic. The symptoms are similar, dyspnea, dry cough, fever, night sweat with constitutional symptoms. For cutaneous manifestation, there are three types of lesions seen. Erythema nodosum is transient. This is also seen in tuberculosis. Maculopapular lesion is the most common form of chronic lesion seen in sarcoidosis, but lupus perneal, a macular lesion characteristically seen around the nose bridge and beneath the eyes, has a high diagnostic value for sarcoidosis. So it is useful, similar to how choroidal tubercle is for miliary TB. Uvitis is the second commonest extra pulmonary manifestation. Patient may present with red and teary eyes. The most common presentation for liver is actually jaundice due to intrahepatic cholestasis rather than hepatosplenomegaly. Splenic enlargement due to granulomas cause splenomegaly in a small number of patients. Alright, by now I think you can appreciate that for some disease, the certainty of diagnosis can be achieved clinically, such as pneumothorax and pleural effusion. Asthma may require a simple test such as by looking at the PEFR reversibility with bronchodilators, but most of the diseases that we discuss in the first and second video, we can narrow down the differentials up to a certain point but it is difficult to conclude a particular diagnosis definitely with clinical evaluation alone. So in most cases, chest x-ray is at least required. So for the next video, I will try to summarize chest x-ray findings for each disease. But that's it for now. If you found this useful, share this video with your colleague, subscribe for future videos. Thank you for watching. Bye bye.